think I'm good to go, Katie. <clears throat> All right, welcome to our inaugural day of excellence in academics. I'm so pleased to in include all of you in our discussion today um, of what we can do within academics at Women's College Hospital. Um, when I planned this day, I really wanted to make sure that we were able to highlight uh, Dr. Jim Ruderman and give the Jim Ruderman lecture on leadership and innovation in order to highlight a family physician who was revered at Women's College Hospital and had done so much for the community. And so it's a real pleasure to um, uh, introduce Jay Shaw, who's going to introduce the lecture today. And uh, Jay Shaw is actually um, most recently appointed as the Assistant Professor, Department of Physical Therapy. He's the Research Director in Artificial Intelligence, Ethics, and Health at the, Joint, at the Joint Center for Bioethics at University of Toronto. And what's important for us is that he's actually a scientist here at Women's College Hospital at the Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care. Um, he previously did some of his postdoc with Trish Greenhall, and we're really um, pleased to have her here with us today. So thank you, Jay, and, um, and thank you everyone for joining us today at this lecture. Thanks so much, Rulan, for, for kicking us off. And I am going to get started with a land acknowledgement, and then I'll, I'll introduce the Professor Trish Greenhall, Jen, and say a bit about her work. So, we, we would like to acknowledge that uh, the land we're meeting on is, is the traditional territory of many nations, and those include the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and, and Métis people. And of course, we're, we're talking about the land that Women's College Hospital sits on and, and the, the city of Toronto. Many of us are joining from there and from the city, but uh, also are, are speaking through cables and signals being, being sent across land uh, elsewhere as we listen to uh, Professor Greenhall just talk today. So uh, we acknowledge our, our presence across the lands as well. Uh, and we acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I would encourage our attendees today, if you're not familiar with the Center for Wise Practices in Indigenous Health housed here at Women's College Hospital to Google that phrase uh, Center for Wise Practices in Indigenous Health, uh, and, and go to the website and look at the so important resources on, on history, introduction to, and current initiatives around First Nation Inuit and, and Métis Health. So I, I have the great privilege of, of introducing Professor Trish Greenhalge uh, today, and Professor Greenhalgh will speak for, for a, about 30 minutes, it seems, and, and that means we'll have lots of time following her, her presentation for questions and, and some discussion, and uh, we'll, we'll end the session by 12 noon. I, I know that sometimes speaker introductions are shortened for time, but in this case, I think it's important to relay Trisha's complete introduction for anybody who might not be familiar with her, her work, so apologies in, in advance, Trish. So P Professor Greenhouse leads a program of research um, at the interface between the social sciences and medicine and, and working across primary and secondary care. Uh, her work looks to celebrate and retain the, the traditional and humanistic aspects of medicine and healthcare while embracing contemporary science and technology to improve health outcomes. And there are three key interests that, that we can observe across the sort of corpus of her work, and these relate to health equity uh, as a first, innovation in healthcare, innovation broadly understood and, as a second, and, and the complex links between research policy and practice as a third. And she's brought that interdisciplinary perspective to bear on uh, the research response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it has you know, certainly has, has been well attended to for looking at diverse themes in the pandemic related to virtual care, uh, the science and anthropology of face coverings, and policy decision-making under these conditions of immense uncertainty. And Professor Greenhalge is the author of over 400 peer-reviewed publications and, and 16 textbooks, uh, re remarkable. Uh, she was awarded the OBE in the UK for services to medicine by Her Majesty the Queen in 2001, made a fellow of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences in 2014, is also a fellow of the UK uh, Royal College of Physicians, Royal College of General Practitioners, Faculty of Clinical Informatics and Faculty of Public Health. 
So, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge the sort of breadth of impact that Trish has had it, through her work and um, summarizing her program and, and her accomplishments is an important part of that. And I can say that Professor Greenhouch brings her commitments to her work with her team and, and has been a generous mentor to a diverse range of scholars and, and collaborates widely around the world. And so with that, we'll transition to uh, Trisha's talk, it, which is titled Science in the Public Eye, Communicating and Debating Research Findings in Real Time in a Global Public Health Crisis. So over to you, Trish. Well, thank you uh, very much, Jay, for that very generous introduction. Thank you, um, Rulan, for uh, hosting. Uh, and to the University of Toronto, um, which is a, just a great institution. It's a real honor and privilege to, to be here virtually uh, and to give the annual Jim Rudiman lecture. Um, I'm assuming you can see my slides. Um, we should now be looking at a, a, a slightly blurry Google images picture of, of Jim himself. Um, you'll let me know if you can't see it. Um, Jim, I, I did a bit of research on, because when you give a, a named lecture, you want to find out know, who, who is the, who was this person? Um, and I was delighted to discover that Jim was first and foremost a family physician like me. Um, Jim had, had very wide clinical interests, uh, which included the safe management of pregnancy and childbirth, um, the maintenance of the clinical relationship over years or decades, what we, we now call continuity of care, the interdependence of physical, mental and emotional well-being, particularly in the elderly, and the holistic management of what we now call multimorbidity. Jim was one of Canada's first academics in family medicine at a time when, when the, the academic, the disciplinary basis of family medicine uh, was focused primarily on things like the social context of illness and the relationship between patient and physician. I think it's, it's since then it's all gone a bit big data, but certainly um, at the time um, it was all about the, you know, the, the doctor-patient relationship and, and the social context of illness, which are, which are themes that are very, very dear to my heart. As I understand it, Jim wasn't a professor himself, but he established one of Canada's first chairs in family medicine. Uh, and as I'm sure you all know, he had a, a national reputation as a teacher and a mentor. And if you Google his name, as I did uh, yesterday, you'll find a rich seam of dedications from students whose master's or PhD theses he either supervised or enabled. And I particularly liked the dedication to, from one ex-mentee who thanks him for covering a phase of busy clinical shifts for her while she wrote up her PhD. This, of course, is 21st century leadership, not the lone hero who quickly rises to the top and covers himself in glory, sometimes at the expense of other people, but the humble builder of happy teams and confident juniors, whose achievements can be measured by the sheer number of people who were supported and inspired by him before going on to do great things themselves. So just to come back to the topic of this year's lecture, science in the public eye, communicating and debating research findings in real time in a global public health crisis, I think this topic is one that Jim would have been interested in. He strikes me as the kind of man who would have wanted the public to understand science and would have wanted scientists to make the effort to communicate with the public. Jim died in 2015, and that was a, a year when the term post-truth was already in widespread use. It actually uh, was first used in an essay on politics in 1992, but that term had yet to enter the dictionary. When it did enter the dictionary in, in 2016, post-truth was defined as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. 
And that, I'm afraid, is the era, era we're now living in. And this lecture is going to consider how we, as scientists, might try to handle it. As Roy Shulman said in a conference that was held back in June 2020, not far off two years ago now, the COVID-19 pandemic is a unique phenomenon constituting the most blatant expression of dangers of the post-truth age. The period of the pandemic has been characterized by less confidence in institutions, a lack of agreement on facts, and a blurring of the line between opinion and fact. And that has most certainly become more true uh, over the last 22 months since he originally said it. Well, a few months after that conference on post-truth, someone reported on Twitter, uh, this, is, this is November 2020, someone reported on Twitter that President Trump had made the claim, I came up with vaccines. Uh, and I responded uh, with this little tweet, and I'm on the front cover of Vogue. Four hours later, um, disappeared courtesy of Craig Yamey. I think as fake news goes, Craig's effort wasn't bad. How many of us will be able to distinguish that from the real front cover of Vogue? Um, le leaving out the fact that I, I'm not quite the kind of person that normally appears on it, but you can, you can produce some pretty good fake news very quickly these days. Let me tell you, um, about our MSc course, or a little bit about our MSc course uh, at the University of Oxford. This is something I set up a couple of years ago with some colleagues. And um, one of the first, actually the very first exercise that we set our students is to go and find a fact. Carefully note the context in which that fact was generated. And then bring your fact back to class and defend it to your classmates. Now I can tell you, we've run this exercise three times now, no fact that has been brought in by a student has ever survived the scrutiny of the classmates unscathed. It was interesting to see that many of our students shared a lot of assumptions which other students didn't share about what counted as a fact and what didn't. Now, this go and find a fact exercise originally came from sociologist Steve Woolgar. And Steve Woolgar published a book a few years ago with the philosopher Bruno Latour, who you may have heard of. Uh, he's one of the authors, of course, of actor network theory. And their book is subtitled The Construction of Scientific Facts. It's about how social relations and norms in the laboratory mean that certain facts come to be discovered while other facts never are. Now, Latour and Woolgar took an anthropological approach uh, in which they saw the scientists as a kind of tribe whose myths and rituals could be studied. As they said, some statements made by scientists appeared to fellow scientists more fact-like than others. The scientific tribe develops what's known as inscriptions, that is, visual representations of agreed facts, which then become stabilized as the way things are, or at least the way those scientists believe they are. Now, let's go back to social media and look at a few more claims that have been circulating. Here's one on face mask safety from the early weeks of the pandemic. Uh, your health, your life, your choice, it says. Know the facts before you wear one. Masks, say this pamphlet, decrease oxygen uptake. They increase toxin inhalation. They shut down the immune system. They increase your virus risk by triggering dormant infections. They are scientifically inaccurate because the virus can penetrate the holes in the fabric and they've not been studied in rigorous peer-reviewed research. OK, well, I copied the style and symbolism of the anti-mask pamphlet. I constructed my own set of statements. I, too, headlined my pamphlet, your health, your life, your choice, know the facts before you wear one. 
Masks, I said, have no impact on your oxygen intake, no increase in toxic inhalation, no damage to your immune system. They decrease virus transmission. The mesh size is scientifically accurate since viruses don't travel naked. And there's strong evidence of the effectiveness of masks, especially when used to protect others. Now, unlike the original author, I could substantiate my statements and I'd searched for what scientists call disconfirming evidence, which would have prompted me to alter my interpretation. But the anti-mask pamphlet was more popular, at least with some groups. On the right is a tweet from Scott Atlas, President Trump's erstwhile advisor on COVID-19. Dr. Atlas isn't too keen on masks. In this tweet, he cites three well-respected sources, the World Health Organization, the US Centers for Disease Control, and Professor Carl Hennigan from the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Now, I'm sure that none of these sources would fully endorse the statements on the left-hand graphic, but as Dr. Atlas says, all of them have expressed reservations about the limited evidence for the efficacy of masks in the context of protecting the public. As pandemic scientists soon learned, once you've put a scientific claim into the public domain, you can't control who deploys it or for what purpose. Now, I want to introduce you to two very different tribes of scientists, and I'm drawing a little bit on this book by Tony Betcher and Paul Trowler called Academic Tribes and Territories. I've shown the two tribes here with their traditional totems and war paint. The first tribe is called evidence-based medicine and its totem is the hierarchy of evidence, which I'll explain on the next slide. The second tribe is one I've called pragmatic public health and its totem is the multifaceted real world case study illustrated here with this wonderful graphic from a health foundation report on domestic violence. So let's have a look at the evidence-based medicine tribe. This tribe adheres, as I've said, to the hierarchy of evidence, actually a hierarchy of methods with randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews of randomized trials at the top. Good science for this tribe is defined by the use of correct methods. Some methods are accepted as better than others. Indeed, a, a poor example of a higher up method may be seen as better than a good example of a lower down method. It is a deeply held myth amongst most, most members of this tribe that if participants are randomized in an experiment, that's good science. And if they're not, it's less good science. Here's an example of science produced by the evidence-based medicine tribe. Jefferson and Hennigan identified randomized trials of masks for preventing respiratory infections. They used a checklist called a risk of bias tool. You can see it on the right of this slide. Each research study got a score according to how biased they judged it to be. Now, using quality standards that were culturally agreed among their tribe, Jefferson and Hennigan concluded that there was no good evidence for the efficacy of masks. They placed non-randomized trial evidence, everything below that top red triangle in their hierarchy of evidence, in a metaphorical trash can. Now, because this tribe ranks by method and only by method, they felt they didn't even have to look at any other kinds of research. And thus was born the fact, in inverted commas, that there's no evidence that masks work. So looking again at Dr. Atlas's tweet, you can see what's happened here. It wasn't perhaps that the evidence-based medicine tribe was deliberately trying to mislead, but for reasons I'm gonna go on to explain, I do believe that their assumptions didn't serve them well in this particular example of constructing a fact. So now let's look at a different tribe. It too has its totems and rituals. And since I myself identify with this tribe, I'm gonna find it a little bit more difficult to be critical of it. This tribe holds passionately to the belief 
that there is no universally applicable hierarchy of evidence, though some methods may be more or less fit for purpose. Good science is defined by this tribe as the use of multiple methods, adaptively and pragmatically, and also ethically and democratically, to build a nuanced narrative of what's happened in a particular real world case and why. Theory is assumed by this tribe to be at least as important as method. As Ken Judge put it, strong theory, flexible methods. The narrative, say the pragmatic public health scientists, needs to make sense and be plausible to the natives. Now, in pragmatic public health, a lot of additional evidence gets brought to the table. Studies that are ignored by the evidence-based medicine tribe become salient. For example, sneeze videos in which the unmasked person is shown to emit huge turbulent clouds of respiratory droplets and airborne particles, or choir stories in which most people attending a choir practice developed COVID-19 even when they didn't get within six feet of the index case, nor touch any common surface. These pieces of evidence taken in isolation are not proof that masks work, but they demand a scientific explanation and they add to the overall picture. The same goes for natural experiments around the world. Christian Leffler's study of COVID mortality country by country in the days after the first documented case showed that the countries which introduced mandated or widespread voluntary masking by 30 days, the blue and orange lines in this graph, had orders of magnitude fewer deaths than countries which delayed introducing masks beyond 100 days. Again, not in itself proof that masks work, but pretty good evidence that they don't kill you. Then there were the famous ferret experiments in which healthy animals in the top cage became infected with COVID-19 through sharing air with the sick animals in the bottom cage. The only connection between the two groups of animals was an air duct with four 90 degree bends, so designed because droplets can't go round corners. Now the purists will say, wait a minute, you can't extrapolate from an animal experiment to a human being, but the purists are wrong in this case. These scientists were not curing an animal with a drug and then claiming that the same drug will cure humans. They were producing evidence that the virus that was infected, infecting the ferrets, SARS-CoV-2 of course, can travel around corners. In other words, that it's airborne. And if it's airborne for ferrets, it will be airborne for humans, of course. Incidentally, Concerns about harms of masks were not borne out. A review by Teresa Marto's team showed that risk compensation doesn't occur. Indeed, wearing masks is associated with increased compliance with other preventive measures, not decreased. Furthermore, video analysis of thousands of people walking past subway cameras showed that the ones wearing masks touched their faces less than the ones who were not wearing masks. OK, so let's go back more than two years to March 2020, while the World Health Organization was still trying to argue that COVID is not airborne. I got together with other members of the Pragmatic Public Health Tribe and wrote this article for the British Medical Journal. We argued for the precautionary principle. We said we don't have 100% proof that masks work yet, but let's act pragmatically on the basis of the numerous facts which point in the direction of a positive benefit-harm balance. That was in March 2020. Now let's fast forward a year to March 2021. Scientists were still arguing about whether COVID was airborne. On the left is a paper by the Evidence-Based Medicine Tribe, Professor Hennigan and his colleagues, it's still, in April 2022, it is still published only as a preprint because it never passed peer review. But these scientists argue that there is no definitive evidence that the virus is airborne. On the right is a paper by me and my colleagues published in The Lancet 
uh, almost exactly a year ago in April 2021, uh, which offers 10 different streams of evidence that the virus is airborne. The arguments against are few. They're on the left-hand side of this slide. Uh, there is, these authors claim, no consistent evidence of direct isolation of viable virus from air samples, nor is there consistent direct evidence of infection of humans from sharing air. But the arguments in favor are more diverse and in our view, much stronger. They include super spreading events such as choir practices, evidence of long range transmission, such as in quarantine hotels where people never met each other, but shared the air from a common corridor. Asymptomatic transmission where people pass on the virus without coughing or sneezing. The fact that transmission indoors is many times more likely than outdoors. The transmission of virus between ferrets in cages connected by the air duct. The fact that air sampling uh, studies sometimes produce viable virus, not always, but sometimes. That the virus can be found in air filters and the only way it can get there is through the air. And the fact that hospital acquired COVID is dramatically reduced by mask wearing. Now, the question of whether COVID is airborne has become heavily politicized. Martin McKee and colleagues offered an analysis from political science that the libertarian right is not only anti-airborne, but also anti-masks, anti-lockdown and pro-segmentation. That is, they say that the old and vulnerable should stay at home in order that the young and less vulnerable can enjoy their freedoms. Uh, so all that goes in, in, in a package and that this basically mild disease should be allowed to wash over the population to achieve herd immunity. Jason Harson, in a paper entitled Toxic White Masculinity, has argued that the proponents of this view tend to be, although they're not necessarily white and male, aggressively confident and hierarchical and dismissive of traditionally female traits such as emotionality, power sharing, and admission of uncertainty. COVID-19 has already changed fundamentally and perhaps forever how academic findings are generated, reported, disseminated, and shared with the public. This goes far beyond what Helga Nowotny and colleagues were talking about two decades ago when they introduced the concept of mode two science. That is a time when facts are less certain and with a composition more heterogeneous, values more contested, methods more diverse and boundaries more ragged. No, I think this is mode three science, a politicized and sinister engagement with non-science by a poisoned and partisan society. We're no longer in Thomas Kuhn's relatively apolitical world in which those who wished to break with an old paradigm could simply take their football and go and play in a new field. We're in the world described by Michel Foucault back in 1966, a world in which knowledge, that is particular versions of the facts and power are intimately intertwined. Powerful people and powerful institutions can define what knowledge is and whose knowledge counts. As Foucault himself put it, in any given culture and at any given moment, there's always only one episteme that defines the positions of possibility of all knowledge, whether expressed in a theory or silently invested in a practice. What Foucault didn't predict is how social media trolls would come to weaponize this dominant discourse. Now, I want to highlight four approaches that I and my team and my colleagues have been using to cope with the way that our science has been caught up in these entanglements. The first is reflexivity. Picture number one is a picture of the river Thames near my house. Every morning I go there, often before it gets light. Sometimes I go for a swim, but I always take an hour away from my work to think. And one thing I often reflect on is my ethical duties as a scientist, 
working for the public good and how I might best discharge those duties in the current context. Secondly, and not nearly so pleasant, is painful engagement. The only way that we can respond to what people are saying about us is to read it. We don't need to read every word, but we do need to know the ad hominems and the way that our facts and also uncertainties about facts are being twisted. Thirdly, epistemological labor, the work that we scientists have to do to expose particular paradigmatic assumptions and systematically challenge them, which is partly what I've been up to in this lecture. And finally, taking that a bit a stage further, deconstruction to overcome attempts to distort our findings, we need to literally take apart the words that people are using and the diagrams that they're circulating. Now, since the pandemic began, I've published over a hundred papers and book chapters. Quite a few of these and several more in the pipeline are what I called on the previous slide, epistemological labor with co-authors from philosophy, linguistics and the critical social sciences. I set out the kind of arguments I've been putting forward to you today, and then I subject my claims to peer review. I'm writing science, and I'm also writing about science, its assumptions, its values, its methods, and its credibility. These are all on the line. This kind of reflection on science is not something I've ever managed to get funding for. I do it in my, quote, spare time, unquote, in between the empirical studies that today's professors are expected to concentrate on. But as we face the future in a pandemic that is now well into its third year and shows no signs of going away, I think we need to recognize the value of such epistemological labor in preserving our very sanity in this relentless post-truth world. These clips are taken from UK newspapers recently COVID-19 is now such a mild disease that even our 95-year-old queen didn't need to miss a day's work when she got it recently. We can apparently ride out the Omicron surge without any restrictive preventive measures. And if we don't want to find COVID in our essential workers, all we need to do is stop testing them. I'm going to give the last word to Hannah Arendt, whose book Men in Dark Times was first published in 1968. She said, if it is the function of the public realm to throw light on the affairs of men, then darkness has come when this light is extinguished by credibility gaps and invisible government, by speech that does not disclose what is, but sweeps it under the carpet by exhortations, moral and otherwise, that under the pretext of upholding old truths, degrade all truth to meaningless triviality. And on that note, I'm going to stop and invite questions. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you so much, Trish, for this <clears throat> tour of your experiences and your work over the past couple of years and um, this deep reflection on what you've learned about the institutions of science. Um, I, I think this will lead to a whole series of questions. And first, I would say to the attendees, please do place your, your questions in, in the Q&A. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that we'll get started with, get people's um, thinking flowing, and um, I will come back around to keep an eye on, on the Q&As as well. So Trish, for my first question, I, I want to stay with the, um, the, the content that you've presented. And I think you've you know, really nicely clarified a couple of central issues around scientific disagreement and, and the establishment of disciplinary or epistemic tribes. Um, and the story of face masks shows that the sort of a conventional or, or hegemonic approach to science can be can be wrong. The way in our popular thinking we tend to think about science, and I imagine the anti-interventionist public would really enjoy that observation: anti-mask, anti anti-vax, anti um, and that seems to imply that there's this really drastic need to like thread the needle in messaging about 
scientific disagreement or or scientific uncertainty. And my question is just, you know, in your reflections, what are your thoughts about that? How should scientists think about their words in public, knowing that those words will have a social life of their own, in a sense? Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I guess there isn't a simple answer to that, but I think we are way, way beyond the stage where uh, we, where the vision of science was that there's a bunch of facts out there and all you've got to do is go and find them. And if you remember right at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought, wow, that we don't know very much about uh, COVID-19, but, but very soon, if we, if we do enough research and if we do it quickly enough, if we publish it quickly enough, we will then resolve all the uncertainties, uh, we'll resolve the disagreements. And so you could call those known unknowns, if you like. So, so, so um, and there were some known unknowns. You know, I mean, the, the, the first trial was uh, showed dexamethasone is useful in people needing supplementary oxygen or something like that, you know. So, so there were a few things where you could focus your PICO style question and then go off and do a bit of EBM in an RCT and get an answer. But actually there are so many questions which despite 200,000 articles on Medline about COVID, I may have that number wrong, but a lot anyway, um, we still are arguing about it. And the idea that you've just got to go and get more facts to resolve this um, is, is clearly not the case. And I mean, in, in a way, that's one of the most interesting things about the pandemic is the way it has thrown science into this space where science really doesn't want to be. We quite liked being in our ivory <laughs> towers. So anyway, your question to me, Jay, was what do we do about that? And I think most, most of all, the most important message to scientists, I would say, is reflexivity you have to be aware of yourself as a scientist in this post-truth world you can't ignore that um, you have to be aware that what you see in the way of scientific questions is shaped by the tribe whose war paint you are wearing those those things are not self-evident and so i think uh, we need to bring out a bit more reflexivity around science um, and I think one of the things I found really useful and really fun is, is going out and playing with members of other tribes. And, and I'm working with engineers and I'm working with mathematical modelers and I'm working with, I don't know, people who sing and dance, um, um, someone studying graffiti. And these are, these are not areas that I'm an expert in, but the more I work with those people in interdisciplinary ways, the more dialogue I have with them, the more I am able to examine my own assumptions. And that actually is um, uh, what someone was saying to me this morning, uh, she was using the term post-normal science. And we, we really need to get comfortable in that post-normal world because we ain't gonna go back to, 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 to standard normal science as, as per Kuhn. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> the second question I had was about strategies to promote reflexivity. So you've anticipated that and, and answered it, going and finding other sandboxes to play in, thinking about interdisciplinary collaboration. So, so that's great. Very helpful. Um, so well, question. I, can I yeah. just say one more thing about that is that they, this kind of thing takes time. And although, you know, that recommendation to, to do more interdisciplinary stuff, to do more thinking, to do more reflecting, as I, I briefly hinted at in my talk, people don't tend to fund this. They tend to fund empirical work, particularly experiments and particularly trials. It's actually quite difficult. We went to a funder and said, could you please give me some funding to go and hang out? Um, when I was a kid, I was always going playing in other kids' gardens, and my mother would say, why are you wasting your time? Uh, but actually, that, those linkages are key. So I think there's a message to um, the people who enable and fund and sponsor scientific research is that these interdisciplinary interactions are not an optional extra. They are absolutely front and center uh, to the progression of science as it now is. So I think that there's a message there to, to, the, to the funders and the strategists. 
you've responded to one of the questions that's come in, which was around which was around funders, and I think. Um, as, as much as there's language uh, and intent around providing funding for interdisciplinary work, it continues to be a challenge around how that becomes operationalized. So just want to open up a space to see if you have any further comments well, on that. Yes, I think so there's one, actually, there's a, there's a really kind of weird thing about interdisciplinarity, which is depending on which discipline you come from, you define it differently. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I was involved uh, both in 2014 and also in 2021 in these research excellence framework uh, exercises which is a bit of a weird thing that we do in the UK it's a bit like the university olympics where once every seven years all the universities judge all the other all the work of the other universities and there's about 30 or so different panels uh, within the what we call the ref uh, and Within the more social science and humanities panels, interdisciplinarity is, as I've defined it, working with people who have different assumptions to you so that you then become more critical and more reflexive about your own assumptions and you generate some kind of higher order insights from your differences. But actually, in some disciplines, um, for example, um, some of the sort of... Um, say computer science disciplines who who work with biologists and medics interdisciplinarity is just a lot of people getting together to get a huge amount of statistical power to analyze a massive great data set and they all share the same assumptions uh, and you can say to them you need to you know this is my interdisciplinarity and they'll say to you well my interdisciplinarity doesn't have any kind of conflict um, you guys need to sort yourselves out. So there's some quite interesting stuff about what we mean by interdisciplinarity. And if you've only got one reality in your worldview, um, the, wor the word interdisciplinarity doesn't have the same meaning for you. And that, that's quite problematic. So maybe we need to start using different terms. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have several questions coming in. I've been sort of grouping them together as they arrive. And now, I suspect it will be no surprise, uh, Trish, to see that there are a couple of questions about the droplet aerosol controversy. And I think okay. a, a couple of people have asked, um, just for you to elaborate a little bit more on that, what that particular uh, controversy represents about uh, tribes and about the prospect of achieving uh, agreement or consensus on something that's rooted in these sort of uh, historical commitments from different uh, scientific parties. Yeah, I know this is a really interesting one. And I've, I've, I've written a few things about that recently. Um, so where to, I could talk all day about the droplet aerosol controversy. <laughs> um, and so stop me when you've heard enough. But I think one of the things that was really interesting about the pandemic was how quickly um, people in the global north certainly um, seized on the idea that this was a droplet transmitted infection when there was actually no evidence that it was droplet transmission and there still is no evidence but if you remember very very quickly we all got into hand washing and Gloria Gaynor got on and made a video about hand washing and you had these um, hand sanitizers put up outside um, all the stores and all that kind of thing uh, and people started talking about masks as as um as fomites that you would contaminate them with droplets. And um, we have this phrase, it's a, it's a piece of cloth, not a landmine. But you remember when you weren't allowed to go anywhere near a mask in case you caught COVID from it. Now, why did that happen? And as we've argued in, in one of the papers that I referred to um, towards the end of my lecture, it was partly because there was one particular committee at the World Health Organization, the one that was looking at infectious disease transmission, uh, and the people who made up that committee were from a very narrow uh, group of scientists. They, they were mostly doctors and, and the ones that weren't doctors were mostly nurses and they worked in hospitals and they were involved in uh, controlling the spread of disease within hospitals. And within hospitals, until quite recently, the big worry was that if you had someone with inf an infected leg wound, uh, and you were the doctor and you didn't wash your hands before going to the next patient with, a, with a, some other kind of wound, you would actually transmit infection between those patients, which is why hand washing 
is really, really important. It's not, it's not a myth, you know, if, if you're talking about wound management in a hospital setting where people are stepping from bed to bed, hand washing is absolutely key. And it just so happened that the people who made up the key WHO committee were people whose life's work was these hand washing trials, randomized controlled trials of different ways of getting doctors and nurses to wash their hands. So guess what? When they looked at a new disease, what many of them saw was a droplet transmitted infection and the obvious solution was hand washing. Uh, now, why did that, um, I'm going to call it a myth, why did it take hold? Why did it become so widespread? Certainly in the global north, as I said, the, the Asian countries were way ahead of us here. They, they saw it as airborne and they treated it as airborne. And as a result, they saved a lot of lives. Uh, but in the global north, it took on. Uh, and one of the reasons was that um, many of the people on key policy committees, policy decision making groups, uh, you know, in the UK, certainly, but also in, in the US, in, in across Europe, I think in Canada too, many of the people were also infectious diseases doctors um, who, whose uh, journals were full of randomized controlled trials of uh, hand washing. And uh, I'm, I'm caricaturing slightly, but, but they were in that disciplinary space. Uh, and as a result, we, are, we still have a, a situation where most people on this planet do not think that the predominant mode of transmission is airborne. And yet there is absolutely no scientific doubt in my mind that, that this is an airborne disease. Okay. <clears throat> That's probably enough, but I could carry on talking about this if you want. <laughs> no, I think, you know, it's, it's a clear, um, a clear assessment of your, your experience participating in, in that debate. And in the context of th that you've set with the comments in your talk, I think it's, helpful for people to hear a bit more empirical detail about um, you know, that experience. So I'll um, pose a question here now, uh, two questions that are connected and um, that might be a bit easier as several questions have come in. So th there have been questions about how your social media participation evolved throughout the pandemic. And this is linked of course to what the public here is how the public digests science. And, uh, you know, certainly the, the role of publics in science is not simply as a receiver, but as a, mm. a, as a co-producer um, yeah. in the sense that Sheila Jasanoff used that sense. And so there's a yeah. question, there's a question here around what, what role ought the public, you know, or publics, members of the public play in shaping science. So first around your social media participation and how that's evolved, and second around the potential roles for publics in science. Gosh, interesting. Um, well, first of all, I, I never really set out to have a big social media following. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I didn't sort of sit down one day and say, oh, I want to be, I want to have a big platform on social media. Um, I remember that coming up to Christmas 2019, so just as the, the first few cases of, of, of the coronavirus were, were being described, I remember looking and thinking, oh, I've got 45,000 followers. And now I've got, a, I can't remember how many, but 170, maybe 180,000 followers. So in the last couple of years, my followers have more than quadrupled. So that I didn't do that. Some, I don't know why they, they follow me. So, so in a sense, what I was doing before the pandemic was I, I had quite a few followers, but I was tweeting on mostly my work, but, um, you know, my, my own scientific work uh, and commenting on other people's work. But since the pandemic, I've tweeted about almost nothing else except the pandemic. Um, and if I look through, if I scroll through my new followers, they've, they're all people clearly who are following me because of what I'm saying about the pandemic. So that's kind of self-reinforcing. And uh, maybe one reason for that is that if I put stuff out about the pandemic, people then ask me questions, people retweet. And so we've got a kind of vicious circle <laughs> that I'm, I've, I've become a kind of pandemic person it is a bit strange because 
I was never an infectious diseases doctor. You know, like I said, I was looking at completely other things. I trained in diabetes. Um, so what was the second question? Um, it, I mean, you know, just to, just to comment on that, but you, you've specialized in understanding evidence, you know, and the evidence transports between health related topics. So, yeah. you know, very interesting. But the, the second question was around how to engage publics in science, which I know is something that you've also done ah, quite yes. a bit about. I know what I was going to say. Um... Because actually, there's not just scientists and the public. You know, that, that, as, as you well know, Jay, I, I think um, a group we need to think about and talk about is what might be called knowledge purveyors or knowledge brokers or, or people whose job it is to package and present knowledge, but also to pull together and synthesize knowledge. And uh, whilst I think um, the media don't don't um, come out too well in in the story of this pandemic. There have been some absolutely outstanding contributions uh, to uh, from journalists, if you like. So, for example, Diane Lewis, I think I'm saying her name right, uh, has published several articles in Nature Communications about what has happened. She had one recently about, uh, you know, why did it take the WHO two years to admit that COVID is airborne? Now, as I understand it, she's a journalist. I, I, I bet she's got a degree and all that kind of thing, but she's certainly not a university academic. But what she has done is interviewed scientists and then she's pulled it together, what Seth Abramson calls curatorial journalism. Uh, because actually, because the pandemic is so complex and so all embracing uh, what someone called a total social fact. Um, you've got to you've got to use a kind of um, synthesis method that that, that respects the, di the the complexity and the holistic na nature, the the pervasive nature of this thing. Um, and that means you've got to tell a story, basically. Um, it means you can't just reduce the world to these little bits and solve each bit. You've got to pull together a story. And some of the people who've done that brilliantly, Diana is one of them. Um, Ed Young is another. He gave a, a talk recently um, where he says for every article he writes, he makes sure that 50 percent of the scientists he interviews are people he's never interviewed before. And I know this because he's interviewed me. Uh, he phones you up and he asks you a few things and he makes a lot of notes and then he, he interviews, you know, 20 more scientists and then he pulls it together in a narrative which includes conveying the nuances, the disagreements. And that is a massive service that good investigative scientific journalists have, have done the public uh, in the pandemic. So um, I would say in addition to the public asking questions and demanding and and you know taking a view on things there are also uh, people who who see their role as primarily writing for the public but there's one more thing i want to say about that actually i'm, I'm now a, a member of independent sage and i'm learning how independent sage works so independent sage it is an independent group of scientists who who set up uh early in the pandemic um in parallel with the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies in the UK, which is the official advisory body on, on emergencies. Uh, and and they're, they're friends with SAGE, they're not, they're not enemies. Uh, but I now discover that really one of the differences between SAGE and independent SAGE in the UK is that SAGE gets its questions from the government, but independent SAGE gets its question from the lay public. Uh, and just yesterday on, on the independent sage WhatsApp group, I'm sure they remember me saying this, is the question came in, a member of the public has pitched a question to us, where did the virus come from? Um, can you please do the, the, the lab leak question or the, um, you know, is it about mink or hamsters or whatever it might be? Um, and so independent sage is now doing a deep dive into that literature and will produce something on it, or at least I assume they will. Um, and I think, so in answer to your question, what's the role of the public? It is partly to be hungry for um, not just the truth, because that's that, as we've seen, that's a slippery con concept, but hungry for a nuanced explanation of this very complex phenomenon. 
Um, uh, and I think that that is absolutely vital and the public have played a, a, an important role there. Okay, thanks, Trish. And um, I'll pass it off to Rulan. Rulan, I'm not sure we have time for the final question, perhaps maybe yeah, really I'll take quickly. A, we'll, we'll, we'll take a couple seconds, hopefully, and uh, ask maybe the last question, Trish. Um, there are a number of us who do evidence-based medicine. And mm -hmm. so I really like the discussion about the tribes because I do think that we do um, get siloed. And one of the things that I think was interesting during COVID was the ability to do team science where there was evidence-based, but you had sociologists and epidemiologists and translation to, to community. And that team science approach was something great. But could you talk about methodologies moving forward about how we could build together and talk about a narrative version of how we should do things versus just numbers alone? And how do you think that that should be combined as we sort of move things forward and we address other things, not just the, uh, the pandemic? Ah, wow, what a question. What an absolute question. I should say that I'm not opposed to evidence-based medicine. I mean, I've written, the, I think, one of the world's best-selling textbooks on EBM. If anyone wants to buy it, it's now in its sixth edition. And But also, more importantly, I'm only alive because of evidence-based medicine. I'm a, I'm a survivor of a, a horrible, um, poor prognosis cancer where randomized trials told the doctors what, what to treat me with. And as you can see, I'm perfectly healthy now many years later. So, so I'm not, I'm not anti-EBM, but as I've shown, uh, I hope, or as I've argued, um, EBM is useful in some situations, but my goodness, it's got above itself in this pandemic. So how do we know? How do we combine things? Um, well, your ex or um, I think ex-provost, Cheryl Misak, is a pragmatist um, philosopher. And I've been working with Cheryl because we've stolen her. She, we brought her over to Oxford for a sabbatical at the moment. And what she would say, I think, as a pragmatist, is you need to bring all the evidence around the table and expose it to critique. So the big problem with evidence-based medicine in the pandemic was not that they were arguing about randomized trials or doing randomized trials. It was this idea that they were the only people who needed to come to the table. Now, if EBM comes to the table and if the anthropologists come to the table and if the mathematical modelers come to the table and if the lay public come with their questions, if everybody is around the table, then according to Cheryl and her pragmatist friends, the discussion of that evidence will lead to some evidence surviving as credible and some evidence sinking as less credible, which is why the flat earthers are very welcome around the table because they won't be able to argue. And, and actually, I showed you a flat earth argument with that mask pamphlet when they start saying, oh, it does this and it does the other. But actually, you can provide evidence to refute those arguments. And so I would say that if we were going to, and I actually had this this morning, somebody from another country, I won't say which country, so they, they were interviewing me because they said our government is, wants to set up a new scientific advisory committee for this, for this government, which doesn't currently have one. Um, and we think it needs to be designed differently. And could you help us design it? And so I was saying precisely this, that one of the things you need is a much more vibrant, agile, diverse, heterogeneous, um, argumentative advisory group. And I also said there should be a time limit for anyone sitting on it. You can serve a term of you know, three or four years and then you get kicked out and someone else comes in with their arguments. Um, and of course you'd need methods to decide who gets on it and all the rest of it. But this, the idea of a closed shop and, and a closed set of methodologies, which are, are not to be challenged, that's when it gets dangerous. I love that answer. I think it's the idea that we need diversity of scientists at the table and the willingness to really have a conversation about the credible evidence that there is. Yeah, so, and not just scientists either. Yeah, I mean, yeah not just scientists, yeah, so, yeah. Everybody, um, yeah. And I think at Women's, we always talk about diversity of people, but yeah. it's also diversity of thought and diversity of yes. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been a fabulous uh, morning so far. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. They were amazing questions. I will definitely give them to Trish because I think she'll be able to think about them because they are so <laughs>
some of them. So um, for everybody who's joining us in the, academic, in the Day of Excellence in Academics at Women's College, please log on to the next Zoom. And for those who are joining us in the round table with Trish, just go ahead and also join in the next Zoom. And we look forward to seeing all of you from Women's College over the next few hours for our, our uh, academic day. Thank you so much again, Trish. It was an excellent lecture. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I will see some of you in 10 minutes. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Cheers. Bye.